I still find it slightly problematic um, that versioning, <coughs> excuse me, that versioning cannot take into account um, what I think I would call cultural translation. So the, the movement from one language to another language uh, already knowing the, the, the mother tongue, the first language. So I wonder, um, I know we perhaps have discussed it today a few times, but I wonder if you could just let us know how you approach that issue. I think one of the problems is none of us are professional translators and therefore our motivation for making versions are very different from people who are actually doing a proper conscientious job. You know, uh, you know, in which case that would involve the kind of consideration that you're proposing. I mean, that kind of cultural translation, you know. Uh, but uh, I don't think we act quite so responsibly. And I think that's the need, you know, to define the thing as a broad spectrum from, you know, faithful translation in which, you know, the, you know, the purity of your means and expertise justify the ends. And maybe where we are, uh, where the ends, you know, sort of always justify the means, no matter how indefensible they are. You know, and I think that, you know, unfortunately, that's not something that... Uh, 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 if one were to also take that on board, and it's just a start thing more than anything else, um, the whole thing about cultural translation and, and, uh, and equivalence, it would be yet another constraint. Um, it's hard enough writing poetry <laughs> without also having the content given and also having to sort of, a, you know, to, to, to start worrying about cultural equivalence. Uh, it's, it's, um, you would never get a poem out of a game that had, you know, so many rules. You know, so it's all about where you find your latitude. And translators actually find their latitude often in abandoning the original architecture. They don't work in rhyme or meter, you know, because they either know or don't know that if they did, they would betray the content. And that's the surface life of the language. And that's the last thing they can do as translators. So they'll give on that. We tend not to give on that stuff, but have to give elsewhere, which means we'll have to rule out the kind of... Remember what I was saying about the latent meaning before, when we were talking about the latent yeah. As it is translated, I just wondered if the nuances of, of the mother tongue do contain that latent meaning, which is perhaps something that might be not missing but um, lost in translation. No, but as, as David discussed. was saying, I mean, it's like we, I mean, Lowell in his introduction to imitations just said, you know, you're never going to get the tone, so you just get a tone. And the reason you can't get the tone is the tone, such as it exists, sits at the confluence of so many different cultural linguistic you know, sort of forces. You will never find an analogue or a coordinate that will, that will be anything like that in the target language. You're talking about a point in face space that disappears as soon as you look at another language. So, it's um, it's um, Blossom Deary is the person I turn to for this. She had a great version of I'm always true to you, darling, in my fashion. So I think that's the best you can do mm. under the circumstances. <laughs> Dalson, wasn't it? Yeah. 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 Do you have another yeah. third um, lady there? Um, you, you've mentioned the sort of healthy instrumentalism, you know, of approaching translation as something you want. It's something you want to get out of a text, and you have your own reasons for doing it. I wondered if you found any interest for yourselves in um, in the experience of being translated, or if that was something that. Um, that, 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 that had ever, you know, the, the, the contact with the translator working on your own work out of English, whether that's something sorry, that um, any of you would... I, I can't hear that. Sorry, sorry could you say that again louder? Oh, right, sorry. sorry um, so <laughs> you've got two deaf people up here. <laughs> sorry, and I've got a cold, so I'm not very audible, but... Your, your own work being translated. Oh. You know that. That's ah. <laughs> Uh, the, sorry, what was the question about? The, the, question was that, 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 the question was whether you found any interest for you as poets in, in correspondence with translators who might be working on... I, mean, I don't know if... Yeah. Maybe translators don't yeah. often have the opportunity to contact a poet when they're translating their work, but whether you found that interesting for yourselves uh, in any way, and if that was something you'd like to talk about. You mean talking to the translator about what you intended? Is that what you're saying? I, I, yeah, do you do that? Hmm? Yeah. Do you do no, perhaps? never, because... I, I couldn't, I, I, it, it would be impossible to, you know, it's what I was saying earlier about the sort of nuance and the gradation of language and the colour and the weight and so on and so forth, you know, the hint, the nudge and so forth that's in language, that if it's your first language you totally understand, or at least if you're a reader of poetry you understand. Uh, uh, um, you know, it, how could you say, how could you make an equivalent of that, you know, in, in a 
in an explanation to say, you know, what do you mean by this? I mean, there are certain things you can, you can, you can sort out we problems of misunderstanding. I remember Robin Robertson telling me once that a translation of his, uh, one of his poems um, had involved there being sardines um, evident in the poem, and he was quite puzzled by why these sardines should have made an appearance. And the word he'd used was silverfish. So, um, Books full of sardines. Yeah. <coughs> yeah sardines, were behind the sardines, fridge. sardines under the skirting behind the fridge. board, yes. Yeah. Sardines under the skirting board. So I guess you can iron that, you can iron out that kind of a problem. You know, somebody says, well, what did you, what, what does this word mean in English? I mean, you know, I think this word means sardines. What does it really mean? Oh, they're these weird little critters that run around the floor near the cat food. You know, but, but I don't see how you could possibly say, here's how you, here's how you will get this inflection. Here's how you'll get this nuance, you know, in your language, which in any case I don't speak. Mm -hmm. you know, but, yeah, and the uh, other thing is, it's like you write these things with kind of inbuilt ambiguity anyway, you know, and an awareness that your own interpretation, if you're forced into making one, you know, or some kind of articulation of its, uh, uh, of its sense, is, is just one. You know, yeah. and therefore it shouldn't take precedent. I mean, the, the whole point is that people are, are allowed to make their interpretation, and your translator's doing that as well, you know, as you do when you translate, of course. Just but it an comes back, sometimes it comes back to um, an almost vulgar <coughs> practicality. I'm, I'm lucky enough to have had some of my poems translated by the great Chinese poet Yang Lian, and he would send me emails uh, asking questions, and at one point he said, Dear Sean, what is a jar? And I said, well, it's, <laughs> it's a ceramic receptacle in which you put things. Yeah. And, um, is this a door? No, it's a door. No, is no, it's, it, is, it was actually a jar. It wasn't a, an actual jar. You know. Oh, I see. But, and he speaks English you know, with extreme, extraordinary fluency. You know, but the idea of there being a jar or a jug, it may have been a jug. Yeah presented a difficulty. So it's sort of a, a really kind of, you know, kind of early level of engagement with the language presents problems, which can in themselves be fruitful, yeah. I suppose. Yeah. But it's also kind of, temp I suppose this, you know, that maps onto our own experience of translating. We always translate out of enthusiasm, and occasionally you get a translator who's doing it for money because they're a professional translator. So, I mean, I've had emails from my German, ex-German translator that said, Dear Don, uh, you know, I am absolutely fed up of your poetry. I do not want to work with you anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Henning Ahrens. It's anyway. mutual. <laughs> but I, I, I can add a small kind of addendum to this. So I had a, a PhD student who was a Chin Chinese student working on a poem by Swinburne in which the word snowdrop appeared and the student wrote, was writing about this poem and had read Snowdrop as a synonym for snowflake because she had never seen the yeah. flower. Yeah. Yeah. And it hadn't occurred to her that that word could have a different meaning. Yeah. And yeah. I, I read this and she came and had, uh, I, I was talking to her and, and a, I couldn't think of anything to do. I said, a snowdrop is a flower. And I, we went to the computer and Googled snowdrop. <laughs> and sort of images of this thing came on, on the screen. And suddenly, you know, then she, she realized, but the flower itself had no associations yeah. or meaning yeah. for her. And imagine but, if that's but, the case, how, how um, complex idiom and the demotic you know, are. I mean, getting to grips with that. Um, I, I really do feel that unless the translator has the original language pretty much as a, as a second language, I mean, it's incredibly fluent. Uh, fluent to the point of being mistaken for a native, as it were, then it's better not to worry about the original. And, and well, I suppose working. one of the great contemporary poet translators is Derek Mahan, you know, who is, um, well, extraordinarily fluent in French, you know, but, but he translates all the French he translates into Mahan. You know. Yeah, yeah. I got it's not that fluent, it's but he, it's all that like comes out as Derek Mahan. Which yeah. is quite a tribute. Really, yeah, he wouldn't want it any other way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's one sure. of the world's great languages, yeah. Mahan. <laughs> can, can, I, can I ask you a question, particularly about this word, 
which um, I don't know how, um, how recently it's come into use, which is the, the word um, versioning as opposed to translating. And I know um, uh, Reza Tahir Kamani, who's in, in the audience here, will, will uh, be familiar with this, that when um, Edward Fitzgerald um, first published uh, Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam, the title page of the first edition reads, translated into English verse. It was anonymous, it didn't say who by, it just yeah. translated in, into English verse. From the second edition onwards, it says rendered yeah. into English verse. And the change from, which is clearly has, has a, is akin to this idea of, of versioning rather than translating, that he'd stepped back from that, that technical term to this more uh, concessive kind of term. But what worries me, I suppose, is that the term versioning um, sometimes, sometimes feels like a concession made by the translator to themselves, as it, as it were. And I wonder what you... For kind of concession? Well, that, that it, it is giving oneself the license that, that the term translation would not give. Well, that's the problem. Yeah, it's that's a, the, it's well, a baggy point, notion. It's, it's, a, point. it's a baggy notion. And, and, and <clears> I suppose <throat> you, can, you, know, you can get away with all sorts of stuff by saying, I've done a version of of this and so on and so forth, but there's, there's quite plainly a difference between, although I know some people can't um, take this on board, there's quite clearly a difference between good work and bad work. Um, and uh, um, I was trying to explain it to somebody earlier and I said it has to do with um, the difference between good and bad furniture. If you sit in a chair and it collapses under you, you're sitting on the floor and you know it's bad work. Um, if you sit in a chair that's going to collapse under you, but the chair collapses, but you still stay ho you're still hovering in midair, then it's because you haven't understood the process. Um, you know, you're lying to yourself. So, so you can, you know, yeah, sure, uh, it's possible to uh, um, cover all sorts of ills by talking about versioning, but there's still good work and bad work. Um, I think the only really, the, the only time I, I sort of really would take my hat off to, to literal trans translations, I mean, word for word, cold, you know, um, literals, uh, were, were in those um, penguin anthologies of, of European verse where you had the original poem and underneath there was a prose gloss. Mm -hmm. And I was totally in favor of those um, because it seemed to me that if you did have the language to some degree or another, even if you had the language to a kind of, you know, vestigial degree, if you could get through the, and you had the prose gloss to just inform you um, a way you were sort of falling down or not quite getting it or just didn't know the word or whatever it might be. That was incredibly helpful and the right way to do things. You know, that aside, I, I wouldn't really be prepared to stand up for, for literalism uh, elsewhere because, because I just don't think it works. I mean, I just really don't. I think it has its, uh, I think it's all about definitions, isn't it? As long as we can, uh, we can agree we're using words in the same way, there's not a problem. You know, as long as translation designates a certain kind of word game and versioning another, there's not a problem. It's, yeah. it's when we hear one, uh, you know, sort of, uh, uh, we'd read one and hear the other. Yeah. Um, if you take, if you take, I mean, if you take the poetry out of poetry as those um, penguin books I just mentioned did, that seems to me to be a perfectly virtuous and, and, and useful thing to do. You know, you've got these prose you translations that what, making any kind of pretense. To, yeah, yes. not making any pretense. Work. But if you take the poetry out of poetry and still try and make try, try and make people believe it's poetry or still represent it as poetry, then then that's wrong. And um, the, the the versions I gave earlier, I, I did a little PowerPoint thing, where, and I had some translations of Ritzos up on the screen. And the point I was making about those translations of Ritzos, where the translators had had all the time in the world to translate these poems. They could write, rewrite, go through it, go over it, talk to Ritzos himself, and so on and so forth. What they wound up with were versions that seemed to me to be representations of those poems, that seemed to me to be no better than Amala Simic's hurried, under pressure, under siege, literal, word for word, checkpoint, a, a checklist 
sketches of her husband's poems, which she sent to me to be made into English poems. I couldn't, I couldn't see a big difference between the two because of this disastrous fealty to the original. So if you looked at, and I got some literal translations from Greek speakers of the poems of Ritzosis that I wanted to work on, if I looked at those literal translations, word for word, no poetry in there, I mean, just literally laid out word for word what Ritzos said, um, no cadencing, no beats, no, you know, I couldn't see that much difference between those and the presumably kind of carefully sculpted out, though not mm. in my view, versions that Ritzos's translation, uh, translators had done of his work. I couldn't see much difference. Yeah, I mean, versioning just implies one more step, <coughs> isn't it? You, which, which is that you then, after the translation, translate it into poetry. So, so my question is, because you said uh, none of you are a professional translator, and I, I quite like to know what, what is a professional translator? How do you define that? Um, going to what Danny said about Fischerl, I think part of the reason that Fischerl um, decided to change the title from translation to, to rendering was that he never thought of himself as a proper, as a professional translate, mm. translator. Yeah. But he was the person amongst all those uh, translators of Persian poetry in the second half of, uh, of the 19th century who were actually his own, his own mentor, Edward Cowell. He was, he was an academic, he yeah. knew Persian, uh, and he was in that sense a professional translator. But he never managed to kind of gain himself that eternity, that, that everlastingness that we, with which we associate Edward Fischerot for his translation of the Rawayata from Akiyam. Um, so my, my, um, yeah, my, my, I'm, I'm going to go back to my first question. What, what is it? What, what, in, in your definition, who is a professional translator? What is a professional translator? Well, my I, colleague at Newcastle in the Modern Languages Department, Francis Jones, is a very distinguished <coughs> academic translator from, for Sorry. example, Dutch and Serbian knowledges, which he, uh, languages which, of which he has a great deal of knowledge. Um, and his task, as far as I know, Francis does not write original verse himself. But, you know, his life's work is to try and bring these poems through into English. So I take him to be a professional translator. Though I wouldn't exclude anybody who wrote their own stuff from being professional. But if you see where the emphasis lies, you know, that his interest is in the act of translation rather than the benefits that might accrue to his own work. And uh, but nonetheless, mean, a professional yeah. translator might be doing so for the same reasons that we do so too, which is out of spiritual affinity. I think if work a work on poetry takes place in the absence of something like spiritual affinity, or whatever you want to call it, then it's unlikely to be any good at all, because you simply will be incapable of infusing the target language with the same kind of excitement of the original. Yeah. You know, uh, you know, it undergoes an alchemical change. You know, when you're excited about what you're writing, and it's kind of irrelevant whether you're doing so with a translator's expertise or a poet's working with a crib, you know? And the absence of that affinity is just not going to work. Well, it, it's the business of saying, would you back somebody who has, who's not, whose knowledge of the language will allow him or her to be mistaken for a, for, for a Serb or a whatever it might be, um, uh, you know, translating that poem, you know, or a poet who doesn't speak the language, but who is a poet. You know, because it's, it, what's being translated is a poem, not, you know, not, a, not a news piece or a, you know, um, or a technical manual or something. So, so you know, there's a confusion or there's a choice to be made um, you know, between the professional translator whose knowledge of the language is second to none, but is not a poet yeah. himself, and a poet who has not that knowledge of the language, or maybe no knowledge of the language. It's a conundrum. I, I back the poet, you know, frankly. Even if you speak French, it might be impossible to translate it into English, but it's not impossible for a poet, if they're good, to translate the soul of a poem. <clears throat> I, do you think that a poet who's translating ought to have a greater responsibility 
for translating somebody else's poem than perhaps even their own. In that, for example, I suppose it depends on the poem, but if you were translating a poem about Bosnia or you were translating a poem that dealt with the oppression that somebody was feeling in Soviet Russia, that it would be unforgivable to do a bad job on a poem like that. <laughs> I don't think poetry um, runs on quite that that scale of gravity. You know, poetry's gravity is to be found everywhere. You know, you could be right, you could be translating an entirely innocent lyrical poem, and the obligation is the same as translating a poem written by somebody being held in the cells at the Lubyanka prison. It's, um, the one is not poetically more serious than the other. Yeah, and I think it's, the, and that's sort of predicated in the assumption that poetry's effect, regardless of what it addresses, is catalytic, you know? Um, you know, and, and, and you have to believe, it's a leap of faith, but one has to believe that the lyric poem can affect the same kind of inner change. You know, and the perception of how things are is that political poem. So, yeah, you, you, you go about it with exactly the same sense of responsibility or freedom or whatever. Well, as Adorno pointed out, you know, even the most sort of privately lyrical poem is really a poem yeah. by history and society, yeah. just pretending, you know, turning its face away from other aspects of its, of its occupation. Yeah. So, could, could we say that um, versioning is a relative of ekphrastic poetry. Is a relative what? Mm. Is a what? Is a relative of <coughs> ekphrastic poetry. No. No, ekphrastic poetry isn't a genuine category. I mean, uh, um, versioning is, uh, uh, is elastic, um, uh, and it's not descriptive. <coughs> I know, uh, uh, and I think that the meaning, well, you know, words of the way we use them, as a man said, and, and, and uh, the meaning of ekphrastic, uh, you know, uh, as, um, as uh, primarily representational. I don't think our relationship with the original is, is as simple or anything like it. Well, no, uh, much well a, a lot of it, well, you know, it depends what you've read. But uh, so w would you say that they were similar? You seem to be implying that they are. You, w would you say they were similar? Sorry, love. I think it's a more complex relationship, you know, because I think the prompts, the, the, basically you're working with someone whose prompt is in the same medium, you know, and ours is already a strange meta medium that runs on a, the, 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 you know, the, 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 the science system of language, and it's, and it's the things are simpler when, you, uh, uh, when you're working between media. When you're working with the same media, it's a much more of a complex dialectic, I think, than, uh, uh, than say, the text and the visual. When you're, when you're working between two texts, it's a hall of mirrors, you know, it's a mise en beam. You know, it's, it's, uh, uh, I think it's a far more problematic relationship than, than the ekphrastic. That's my feeling. Could I just take a, a slightly different angle? In musicology, there's quite frequently a, a difference made between study of musical works and composers as notes on the page, and the reception of musical works, which is about audiences, about various kinds of mediation. Thinking of poetry, there are a large number of readers of poetry who are not professionally involved and perhaps not fully aware of some of the difficulties which you've talked about tonight, but nevertheless, they are aware that nearly everything in poetry is translation. And when one thinks of a language like English, nearly all our major poets and all the major innovations in poetry have been to do with encounters with other languages yeah. and other cultures, and I, I, I find this Absolutely, the essence of poetry is something to do with encountering difference and all that goes with that, uh, which seems to be now incredibly important in that as much as the pressures of globalization are, are destroying difference around the world. You've talked about not knowing what a snowdrop is. There will be a generation soon born in this country who will never have heard a nightingale or a turtle dove or seen a piece of English woodland as was known by Pope. So poetry is actually going to have an even more difficult job in, in, in impossible art, it seems to me. And, and therefore, I just wanted to perhaps balance out the pathologies of translation by saying that as a general reader and not as a specialist, it's a hugely important thing. And I'm very welcome. Uh, I, I welcome the, the, the labors that poets take to make uh, other poems and other cultures at least partially available, which of course then might encourage one to try and take the step to make them more available by, by study and so on. Yeah, but you don't want to do that. If you do that, you get people translating out of commission rather than enthusiasm, you know, and if you do that, then it's, you're going to get more bad poetry. <laughs> <laughs>
You know, so you, I think you have to be careful about demanding that, you know... Well, I, I wouldn't make a demand, I'm just being grateful, yes, indeed. No, 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 I know you're not. <laughs> <laughs> you're being very polite in your demands. <laughs> I see what you're saying, but I don't think we have any right to expect that kind of instantaneous translation. You know, it's just like, I think it has to meet its fellow soul in the, uh, in the other language before, the, you know, an effective conduit can be opened up in that way. Just... Well, um, I'm going to... Uh, bring this part of the evening to a close, and I'd, I'd like to express our, our thanks to our three poets for a really extraordinarily interesting and stimulating discussion. Um, thank you very much, three of you.